Chapter Seven and Eight of John Barleycorn or Alcoholic Memoirs by Jack London. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Chapter Seven. I was barely turned fifteen and working long hours in a cannery. Month in and month out, the shortest day I ever worked was ten hours. When to ten hours of actual work at a machine is added the noon hour, the walking to work and walking home from work, the getting up in the morning, dressing and eating, the eating at night, undressing and going to bed, there remains no more than the nine hours out of the twenty-four required by a healthy youngster for sleep. Out of those nine hours, after I was in bed and ere my eyes drowsed shut, I managed to steal a little time for reading. But many a night I did not knock off work until midnight. On occasion, I worked eighteen and twenty hours on a stretch. Once I worked at my machine for thirty-six consecutive hours. And there were weeks on end when I never knocked off work earlier than eleven o'clock, got home and in bed at half after midnight, and was called at half past five to dress, eat, walk to work, and be at my machine at seven o'clock whistle blow. No moments here to be stolen for my beloved books. And what had John Barleycorn to do with such strenuous, stoic toil of a lad just turned fifteen? He had everything to do with it. Let me show you. I asked myself, if this were the meaning of life, to be a work-beast? I knew of no horse in the city of Oakland that worked the hours I worked. If this were living, I was entirely unenamored of it. I remembered my skiff lying idle and accumulating barnacles at the boat wharf. I remembered the wind that blew every day on the bay. The sunrises and sunsets I never saw. The bite of the salt air in my nostrils. The bite of the salt water on my flesh when I plunged overside. I remembered all the beauty and the wonder and the sense delights of the world denied me. There was only one way to escape my deadening toil. I must get out and away on the water. I must earn my bread on the water. And the way of the water led inevitably to John Barleycorn. I did not know this, and when I did learn it, I was courageous enough not to retreat back to my bestial life at the machine. I wanted to be where the winds of adventure blew, and the winds of adventure blew the oyster pirate sloops up and down San Francisco Bay, from raided oyster beds and fights at night on shoal and flat to markets in the morning against city wharves where peddlers and saloon keepers came down to buy. Every raid on an oyster bed was a felony. The penalty was state imprisonment, the stripes and the lockstep. And what of that? The men in stripes worked a shorter day than I at my machine and there was vastly more romance in being an oyster pirate or a convict than in being a machine slave. And behind it all, 
behind all of me with youth a bubble whispered romance adventure so i interviewed my mammy jenny my old nurse at whose black breast i had suckled she was more prosperous than my folks she was nursing sick people at a good weekly wage would she lend her white child the money would she what she had was mine then i sought out french frank the oyster pirate who wanted to sell i had heard his sloop the razzle dazzle i found him lying at anchor on the alameda side of the estuary near the webster street bridge with visitors aboard whom he was entertaining with afternoon wine he came on deck to talk business he was willing to sell but it was sunday besides he had guests on the morrow he would make out the bill of sale and i could enter into possession and in the meantime i must come below and meet his friends there were two sisters mamie and tess a mrs hadley who chaperoned them whiskey bob a youthful oyster pirate of sixteen and spider healy a black whiskered wharf rat of twenty mamie who was spider's niece was called the queen of the oyster pirates and on occasion presided at their revels french frank was in love with her though i did not know it at the time and she steadfastly refused to marry him french frank poured a tumbler of red wine from a big demijohn to drink to our transaction i remembered the red wine of the italian rancho and shuddered inwardly whiskey and beer were not quite so repulsive but the queen of the oyster pirates was looking at me a part emptied glass in her own hand i had my pride if i was only fifteen at least i could not show myself any less a man than she besides there were her sister and mrs hadley and the young oyster pirate and the whiskered wharf rat all with glasses in their hands was i a milk and water sop no a thousand times no and a thousand glasses no i downed the tumberful like a man french frank was elated by the sale which i had bound with a twenty-dollar gold piece he poured more wine i had learned my strong head and stomach and i was certain i could drink with them in a temperate way and not poison myself for a week to come i could stand as much as they and besides they had already been drinking for some time we got to singing spider sang the boston burglar and black lulu the queen sang then i wished i were a little bird and her sister tess sang oh treat my daughter kindly the fun grew fast and furious i found myself able to miss drinks without being noticed or called to account also standing in the companionway head and shoulders out and glass in hand i could fling the wine overboard i reasoned something like this it is a queerness of these people that they like this vile tasting wine well let them i cannot quarrel with their tastes my manhood 
according to their queer notions, must compel me to appear to like this wine. Very well, I shall so appear. But I shall drink no more than is unavoidable. And the queen began to make love to me, the latest recruit to the oyster pirate fleet, and no mere hand, but a master and owner. She went upon deck to take the air, and took me with her. She knew, of course, but I never dreamed, how French Frank was raging down below. Then Tess joined us, sitting on the cabin, and Spider and Bob, and at the last Mrs. Hadley and French Frank. And we sat there, glasses in hand, and sang, while the big demijohn went around, and I was the only strictly sober one. And I enjoyed it as no one of them was able to enjoy it. Here, in this atmosphere of bohemianism, I could not but contrast the scene with my scene of the day before, sitting at my machine in the stifling, shut-in air, repeating, endlessly repeating, at top speed, my series of mechanical motions. And here I sat now, glass in hand, in warm, glowing camaraderie, with the oyster pirates, adventurers who refused to be slaves to petty routine, who flouted restrictions and the law, who carried their lives and their liberty in their hands. And it was through John Barleycorn that I came to join this glorious company of free souls, unashamed and unafraid. And the afternoon sea breeze blew its tang into my lungs and curled the waves in mid-channel. Before it came the scow schooners, wing and wing, blowing their horns for the drawbridges to open. Red stack tugs tow by, rocking the razzle-dazzle in the waves of their wake. A sugar bark towed from the boneyard to sea. The sun wash was on the crisping water, and life was big. And Spider sang, Oh, it's Lulu, black Lulu, my darling. Oh, it's where have you been so long? Been laying in jail, a-waitin' for bail, till my bully comes rollin' along. There it was, the smack and slap of the spirit of revolt, of adventure, of romance, of the things forbidden and done defiantly and grandly. And I knew that on the morrow I would not go back to my machine at the cannery. Tomorrow I would be an oyster pirate, as free a freebooter as the century and the waters of San Francisco Bay would permit. Spider had already agreed to sail with me as my crew of one, and also as cook while I did the deck work. We would outfit our grub and water in the morning, hoist the big mainsail, which was a bigger piece of canvas than any I had ever sailed under, and beat our way out the estuary on the first of the sea breeze and the last of the ebb. Then we would slack sheets, and on the first of the flood run down the bay to the Asparagus Islands, where we would anchor miles offshore. And at last my dream would be realized, I would sleep upon the water. And next morning I would wake upon the water, and thereafter all my days and nights would be on the water. And the queen asked me to row her ashore in my skiff. When at sunset, French Frank prepared to take his guests ashore. 
nor did i catch the significance of his abrupt change of plan when he turned the task of rowing his skiff over to whisky bob himself remaining on board the sloop nor did i understand spider's grinning side remark to me gee there's nothing slow about you how could it possibly enter my boy's head that a grizzled man of fifty should be jealous of me 